everybody all you in here and out there and at the podium. I know it's really exciting. We're all so grateful to have you here today. Um, I'm Joan Lugano at Cyber and Industrial Cultural Center. We can't hear you. Yeah. 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 The mic's not on. on. Just yeah. listen. Uh, we're still recording my data. All right, I'll do my best. Uh, my apologies. Um, <laughs> Elvis, which is also affecting my vocal cords, so I'll do what I can and maybe I'll talk less than I can. It's good for everybody. Anyway, I'm Joan, I run Jack Straw, and I'm really so happy to have all of you here today to help us celebrate Ruth Rose, uh, who was just and will always be a great writer and teacher and friend of Jack Straw and of the community at large. We did so much with Judith over the years, and it's been a really sad but sweet time for us thinking back about you pulling things out and realizing just how much we all did together mm -hmm. uh, she was quite an amazing person um, judith was a 2001 jack star writer and then in 2008 she curated the jack star writers program she was part of a <coughs> three-year composer in residence program we did with echo glenn juvenile detention center she, judith worked with janice katek and the two of them did writing and poetry with young uh, young women at the detention center, and the words that Judith was able to pull out of all those young women became the lyrics for a new work, Navigating the Light, that Judith composed. And we worked with her on her Salmon in the City project, and as a, one of important, a great important figure in the city, being the literary manager for Bumber Street Arts Festival, Judith not only brought writers from all over the place together, but she also gave Jack Star writers a um, larger voice by bringing year after year our writers to the festival. Mm -hmm. And we also put Judith in a different, she was willing to be in a very different teaching situation, the Neckle Glen, and for year after year worked with close to 130 writers at Kimball Elementary School to help each of them individually create their own personal favorite family celebration, and these kids were from all over the world, so it was so diverse and so special. Um, one of the things which I got from an email that I got from Tari, her daughter, uh, this week when I was filling in on where we were on today, and what we, the range of things that would be going on, she said that she knew that Judith would be here in spirit and just enjoying the heck out of her party. <laughs> so all of you, please make sure that that comes true and that she does have a party she can enjoy the heck out. So enough for me. I want to turn this over to Savannah, who is Sarah. I'm Sahara. Sahara. I don't know where Savannah came from. Great. <laughs> 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 so so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's come, who is going to do uh, as going to do a eulogy for Judith, wearing one of Judith's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 As Joan said, and as my mom said, we know that Judd would have been just as moved by the love outpouring for her today. And as we all know, Judd really never was one to turn down a party. Um, so thank you all. Uh, my name is Sahara. I am Judd's firstborn granddaughter, uh, born to her daughter, Carrie. And I am honored to be able to share some of her story with you. Um, Judith Louise Snout was born uh, September 9, 1941 to Aline and Lawrence Nelt. She was the oldest of three sisters. Her family lived in Detroit, where Judith graduated from high school in 1959. While growing up, both Judith's parents were in the union movement, which is likely where some of her fiery spirit was stocked, lit, and tended. Her mother, Aline, was heavily active in the union, serving as the vice president on the union while working at Hudson Motor Company. There are stories of Aline's moxie while working with the union, including the time she allegedly smuggled a stink bomb into the company store of an organization who was hiring scab workers to break a strike. The Nalt dinner table was no stranger to political discourse. 
often holding discussions about union ongoings, workers' rights, and local politics, something that would leave an indelible mark on Judd for the remainder of her lifetime. Judd's family remained close growing up, spending summer vacations in upstate Michigan where Judith learned to water ski at a family cabin, road trips to California, a visit to see relatives in Oklahoma. These were fond memories shared by Judith and her two sisters. Judd remained close with her sisters throughout her entire life, spending many summers traveling to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan where they both lived. Both her sisters, Marilyn and Lori, were by Judith's side as she passed, along with my mother who held vigil for nearly three weeks. While Judith is survived by her two sisters, Lawrence would go, away, go on to pass away suddenly when she was 21. Her mother, Aline, would go on to pass when she was in her 50s. My grandmother loved her mother fiercely. She often shared stories of her with me when I was a child. I remember a few years ago, I came over to her house for one of our semi-regular dinner dates, and she served me an avocado and arugula, or avocado and grapefruit salad for arugula. And it was delicious and strange and not a combination I would have thought to make at all. Uh, and Grandma told me that she'd actually learned her, the recipe from her mother in the 1950s. A relative or a friend had sent the family avocados all the way from California, which was the first time that she'd ever seen an avocado, and she would have been in her teens. Uh, and Aline had read in Good Housekeeping that a good way to, read, to serve the exotic fruit was with grapefruit over arugula with a little bit of salt and olive oil. <laughs> the magazine, I can attest, was right. Uh, Judith met Thomas McCutcheon, or Nick Roche, when she was 15 and he was 21 at a dance. Judith and Mick dated throughout the rest of high school and they were married on December 18, 1960. They first lived in Ypsilanti, Michigan, where Mick was a student at Eastern, Eastern Michigan State University. Their daughter, my mother, Terry, was born in 1961. While there, Judith fell in love with the written word and the study of literature and drama, graduating in January 1967 with a bachelor's degree. Many years later, she would go on to graduate with a master's degree in poetics in 1986. In 1967, the family moved to Washington State, where Judith got a job at Anacortes High School as an English teacher. She taught in Anacortes from 1967 to 1970. In 1970, Judith and Mick's second child, a son, Robin, was born. In those days, it was difficult to obtain a diagnosis for a child with a de developmental disability. It took over two months and several trips to Children's Hospital in Seattle to confirm Robin's diagnosis of Down syndrome. Once confirmed of this diagnosis, the family had to make a difficult decision. Would they choose to keep him, or would they turn him over to the state to be institutionalized, as was a common practice for many families during this time? Resolved and fiery, Grandma Judd was never one to back down from a challenge. The family embraced their newest member wholeheartedly, though not without some difficulty. Schools at that time were not provided, and were not required to provide resources for children with developmental disabilities. And many rur rural schools, like in Anacortes where the family lived, simply did not have them available. It was also during this time that Judith and Mick separated and ultimately divorced. Unable to teach full-time nor access proper resources for Robin, Judith decided to move the children down to Seattle in 1973. At first, things were tough for the small family, with Judith finding part-time work as a substitute teacher. What a break. Uh, in 1974, Judd met somebody new, a New Yorker who had found himself in Alaska. They fell in love, and she decided to follow him to Alaska for a temporary placement in the Union working on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. She left her children in Seattle for six months. It was exciting, it was hard, and one of her greatest adventures to date. Her stories from her time in Alaska include close calls with grizzlies, getting caught on the pipeline by her hair on the accident, <laughs> and of a deep, bitter, and dangerous cold. For as long as I could remember, my grandmother kept an old grizzly paw 
from this time uh, on her bedside for the rest of her life. It was reportedly hacked off by her old lover. Um, we don't know the whole story there. <laughs> and, uh, but I have to say that with age and the prying young fingers of grandchildren over the years, the paw is now painfully delicate and fits in a box. After her contract was up in Alaska, Judith returned to Seattle, single, and used her earnings to purchase a purple house with a green door for her and her children. This house at 178 Lake Dell would be where she would spend the next 43 years of her life. Around this time, she met what was to become the foundation of a formidable band of women and friends, Patricia Berry, Sybil James, and Karen DeWinter, who remained dear and close friends all the way through the end of her life. Uh, and Pat preceding Judith in death in 2018. Over time, Judith's band of wild women would eventually mm -hmm. grow to include a Rosemary, Linda, Stacy, Sandra, and even another Judith. Mm -hmm. Now as I tell this, I realize that there are holes in my story, many, many pivotal characters I haven't mentioned, historical context, poignant moments, <coughs> Judd's development in literature during this time, nor really her involvement in the art scene. And I know this was happening in the background, but I know that this is where many of you come in. Well, I don't know everything. <laughs> I do know this. My grandmother truly loved literature, as anyone who had ever been to her house can attest. She had books literally to the ceiling in her house. She loved books. She devoured books, sort of like she devoured life. I always knew that I could come to Grandma's house and leave with a new book or two, sometimes with her loopy, scrawling handwriting in the margins. I always knew when I received a letter from her, I could pick out her handwriting in any size stack of mail. My grandmother loved deeply. She loved art and magic, food, wine, and people. She loved traditions and all holidays, pagan, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, it didn't matter. She loved the ceremony of it, the reverence, and any opportunity to dress up. She loved animals and the natural world and worked hard to bridge communities to nature through her art. She loved to teach and she was good at it. She taught for over 40 years in a variety of places, including schools, colleges, prisons and communities. Judd was vivacious and fun. I remember living with her for a few months in 2014, and she always had a busier social schedule than me. <laughs> Serious, I would come home at 10 p.m. having been out, and she'd come in at 11.30. <laughs> and we'd stay up till one or two drinking wine together. She was a city girl, and she loved Seattle and all that it had to offer. Judith flung herself into arts and poetry in the city, just as she had with her life, the rest of her life. I had always known that she was an accomplished artist, but I don't think I truly understood the impact that my grandmother had on Seattle's poetry community until she passed this November. From her years as the literary arts director for Bumbershoot and her work teaching poetry, she published a huge array of poetry, including four books and edited many more. One of her books even received an American Book Award in 2007. While her art medium was paper and ink, some of my most favorite works of hers are the large permanent installations she did collaboratively across King County. Like the Blessings for the Water and the Biosolids she did for the Brightwater Treatment Center in Woodenville, her poems on a bus, and her Salmon Sweet poems that play oh, yeah. the Ballard Law. When she passed, I watched memories and poems and videos and articles and photos of her pour in. And it, I think it really was the first time I began to understand how special she was beyond being special to me as my grandmother and truly how many people's lives she touched and intersected with. And the fact that we are at standing room only in this room, I think, is a small testament to that. Shortly after my grandmother passed, I started writing down my memories of her in preparation for this today. And when I went to turn my notes into prose, I realized, holy shit, I've, I've written a poem. <laughs> I think I would be remiss, and I think Judd would be remiss if I didn't share it. So. 
Clark. Right. Judith, grandma. Whimsical, believes in magic, purveyor of plants, encourage self-expression, grand communicator, the author, the poet, the advocate, for Robin and the oppressed, Vietnam to WTO to multiple women's marches, a second wave feminist, she was always a fighter, even to the end. She loved parties and hosting in her purple house overlooking her magnificent garden. Her annual New Year's Day party, a tradition older than I am, used to be legendary, or so I'm told. I will miss her black eyed peas, which is supposed to bring good fortune in the new year. And from what I see now, Judith was a good friend. Well, I know that death and the afterlife aren't the most polite topics of conversation, I wanted to take a moment to talk about Judd's, not so much her passing, because we all know what happened in the end, but rather the profound and beautiful love that we got to see and witness throughout this process of her passing. Judd suffered a stroke about two weeks before she passed. It was sudden and devastating. We knew within a few days that her options were going to be limited. It was decided that she would come home and spend her final days in her beautiful purple house overlooking Lake Washington. And in that time, her friends and family poured in from all over the country. People brought food, flowers, blankets, memories, and their time. We read stories, recited poems, sang, prayed, laughed, cried, reminisced, and loved. It was raw and real and achingly human. Throughout this, Judd would drift in and out of consciousness, but she was mostly with us until the final few days. She listened and did her best to communicate when the pain wasn't much, too much. All through this, her faithful feline companion, Pierre, would lie on the bed, reassuringly kneading her legs through the handmade quilt that came from Michigan with a cousin. She passed peacefully, and surrounded by so much light and love, I'm told you could almost see the glow of that love lighting the way for her on her journey to the stars. On behalf of my family, we extend our deepest gratitude to all of her friends and loved ones who shined light and who were instrumental in the quality of life she experienced in those final weeks. Thank you for loving my grandmother as much as my family does. When I wrote this, I kind of struggled with how do I close this, the right words, because how do you, how do you tell the story of a storyteller, of a master storyteller? And I realized that the best person to close this would instead be Judd herself. So this is Heaven by Judith Roche from her book, All Fire, All Water. When I finally arrive there, after a brief but mortal illness, I'll ask my mother which great-great-grandma picking spring flowers choked a bear with her own fist shoved down his throat. And could it be true? And for her recipe for turkey stuffing, I'll be weeping just to see her again. I'll tell her what I did with the rest of my life, that my later poems didn't have so much sex, so, she <laughs> <laughs> so that she could have shown them to her friends without being embarrassed. <laughs> I'll let her know how the seeds of her stories about Arthur and Guinevere, Abelard and Eloise flamed at the heart of the troubadour, and that one of my children grew up strong, though troubled by the grief of life and her very complexity and the other grew to become a rare, happy man through his own complications. Mm -hmm. And how bitter it became that I couldn't ease their passage through the world. She'll remember that as the bitter way of it. How salmon and wolves opened up in me, and she'll understand with her own wild heart. I'll tell her none of my marriages worked out, except for the children. Mm -hmm. And that my sisters and I still seek our misplaced childhood in each other 
in spite of how bossy I could be as the first child. I'll tell her now <coughs> I understand what she meant those many childhood nights when I couldn't sleep when she told me, it's all right, you're resting your heart. I'll want to know if birds live there, and she'll name me their flaming colors. And I am playing piano again, haltingly at first, but I'm getting it back. That will make her happy. The world, I'll say, is still broken. Ignorant armies clash by night and day with less reason than the ones you knew. She'll just nod as though it's no longer her concern, and perhaps it isn't. I will tell her we are orphans in the presence of her absence, and she'll tell me again the story of the girl with flowers in her hands, the pomegranate seeds, and the other. I want to thank you all. We got my this is my husband. We live on the east side of the mountains, and it is snowing. We got to be at work at eight a.m. tomorrow, so we, we don't mean to be rude, but. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say it's such a privilege to share this afternoon with Jude's family. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for coming. My name is Kathleen Flanagan. I'm just going to be um, uh, introducing some of our guests this afternoon. Um, I've known Judith for many years as a fellow teacher. She was an incredibly gracious and inventive and fun teacher, and I learned a great deal from her. But I think of her foremost as a poet, and she was a wonderful, wonderful poet. And I'm, I'm very happy that we're going to get to hear these poems out loud today. Um, I want to begin with a poem that I think is a perfect poem. Um, it's called The Husbands, and it, um, it is both um, it's got all the heart and soul that you want in a poem. It has the pathos and it has the humor. It's just everything a poem should be. And I'll try to get through it. <laughs> the Husbands. I married them for all the wrong reasons. One for sex, another for a boat. Though the boat wasn't for me, but for the son left behind from the sex I married the first one <laughs> But it was the daughter I carried inside when I married the first one. There were others, but they didn't quite count as husbands. The third I didn't even marry. He read me poems in bed and left little behind, nothing of any value. But the pain turned out about the same. And then there was my daughter, steady, there through all of it, watching me with blue owl eyes, thinking, is this the way you do it? <laughs> we had boat enough to teach us of the sea, the beauty of fish, the sun's love for water. The first left me my daughter and my son, both my dawn, noon, sunset, and night. The husbands are all far away now, too into that great good night, strange to have outlived them. The third, off in his own mysteries. They surface in my dreams. Sometimes even the others join in, as lions, as kings, as husbands. They all blend together, vivid, pur purring loudly, and shape-shifting. I love them or him, the one great husband, for whom I am still a wife. Okay, so we have a wonderful group of poets who are going to be sharing poems this afternoon, and we're going to begin with Nancy Rawls.
This is Helen, when they called her witch. It's from Mur, my life as a screamer. In all the stories, I'm either on the wall or on my back. That siren call echoing in my ears, and I can hardly walk through towns for all the eyes. I'll perfect my disguise, rare version of bitch mask, mm -hmm. rendered in worked leather and paint their roofs with pale gold. Splashed moonbeams I'll ride, those wet roofs into their backyards, and serve them drugged dinners until they find intrigue in their own minds and leave mine alone. <laughs> I have slipped some law but lie under another, something born beneath the bone, a structural grammar of dream, anonymous spirals of stored memory. It's story seen in a mirror. I follow when I rattle at the barriers and push at boundary stones beyond where cracks have closed. I am famous for walking walls, lying down between pattern and random scatter, and I'll claim both. They are deciding I'm a mi minor goddess, esoteric knowledge, a sort of Etta James instead of Bessie Smith. Good, but not big time. <laughs> my stars rise and fall like August nights on my back in hot sand, taking in meteor showers. And scholars worry about my mother, my swan engendered beginnings. Rapture and beating of wings from before my birth imprinted on the line of my limbs. It's me in love with the sweet sax love line. They forget. Silence between the notes. Famos tied to but slipping fertile earth when I go beyond flesh loosened, then left. And how each one push far enough goes back to the same sea. Mar, mare, the blue of all the open sky. Good afternoon. I'm glad to be asked about Judith, although I cannot say I knew her well. I knew Judith as a member of Red Sky Poetry Theater, as director of literary programs for Bumbershoot, and as a contributor to the Raven Chronicles. In our few conversations, I was touched by her devotion to her son Robin and her determination to make the arts accessible to all audiences, an unusual idea in the 80s and 90s. She believed in the power of poetry to heal. I consider myself part of the generation whose way was cleared by people like Judith. Because of her influence, we dared to start a new literary magazine, The Raven Chronicles, which received a Bumbershoot Award for Most Innovative Publication. The Bumbershoot Book Fair provided a colorful bazaar where ideas and magazines and books were bartered and traded. It made me feel rich in friends and in literature. I always brought home more than I took. Because of Judith, I went from someone writing her first short stories, only intelligible to members of her family, <laughs> to reading alongside Carlos Fuentes on a stage at Bumbershoot. Those were heady times for the arts in Seattle. Judith got on that pony and rode, contributing four collections of poetry, as well as several public artworks along the way. Here's a poem she wrote. Little Wild Heart starts the second half, what she leaves and what she takes from her collection ghosts. They have taken my picture to see how I've grown and renewed my driver's license. <laughs> it is the day before my birthday, another kind of renewal. I'm licensed to keep speeding down my own concrete skein 
laid on the loamy skin of the earth to unravel crossroad connections. I'm renewed to carry on the second half of this trip with its certain advantage of leaving early architecture and stretch marks in the dust. <laughs> Gathering lightly as I go, I carry the baggage of hard living while trying to travel light. All clothes go to the Salvation Army, and I, a new woman, rise up, virgin, Virgo again, from the smoke of my September ashes, left only with those scars of the deepest cuts, and of course, the birthmark, teller of autumn tales and reminder of parts that can't be left. There's desert sage pungent in my pocket, and pearly everlasting, small white roadside flame and the dust devil swirl of words that accompany me round fences and signposts. Cell to cell, they carry the fire that forces me, alone and burned clean on this unfinished highway, slipping through the sound of light towards speed of oncoming dark. Thank you. Thank you. Next reader is Anne Percy. <laughs> Judith was just such a presence, and I was a beginning writer when I was invited. Thank you. Um, where are you? Nancy? Nancy Rawls. Anyway, thank you for inviting me into the 2001 Jack Straw program. And I remember arriving late because I couldn't find parking, much like today. I did, but I arrived early because I knew I would have a hard time finding parking. <laughs> but um, so I looked at the Jack Straw anthology from 2001, and this was the poem that just kept sticking in my memory that Judith wrote. And I had no idea what it meant exactly, but I loved it. And this is a poem that I think I could read every day and get a new meaning out of it. And I didn't know her personal life, so I didn't read that into it. But it's called Death Comes to a Flyer. And it starts with this epigraph from a Diane de Prima poem. Our death belongs to Psyche. It is none of the spirit's business. Death comes to a flyer. Someone will come at the end and tell you a story so beautiful you will rise out of yourself and go into it. It will be your own story told true for the first time, and you will shed all that is a heavy and fly, flyer man, with no airplane, no wings, and only the best of you will come along. It will be like the light held inside an angel's bones, resonant, voice of a big bell, summer at the cottage with no shoes, and what song was like before language your own story told true on the other side of grief and the pain that stopped you. Your story beyond what you've done like you've never known it before in words we don't yet understand, but you will, finally flying into it, rushing with wind and heart and wild sweetness to yourself. <coughs> and that is in her book, Wisdom of the Body, which I think is available somewhere, um, by Black Heron Press, and it came out in 2007. Okay. Our next reader is Mercedes Lowry. Oh, yeah, two. Yeah. Mercedes, come on up. Three seats. Three seats. Three seats. Sort of. Sit. I chose this one, Throwaways. For the boys at Green Hill Correctional Center. They are only boys, 
though murderers and rapists. Bad skin is an issue, candy bars a treat. Some are fathers, few have fathers. Ink pens are contraband, though new tattoos bloom daily on arms, inflamed by needles and pain. Beast and throwaway child. No one knows where they get the needles. Hate, love, live, die. They remember beatings and fishing trips. Will hurt themselves if no one will do it for them or one another. Innocence assumes forgiveness. They are both the beast who lives at the heart of the labyrinth and feeds upon the flesh of others and the children thrown to the beast to twist and turn in serpentine path until they meet the hunger that will tear them apart. One boy stares silent with wounded eyes, tied tongue, and writes a poem of ten women whose red dresses spread about their twenty severed hands in cool blood. Even the other boys say he was sick. They haven't read his countryman, Lorca, who writes of sliced off breasts, the stain of three hundred crushed crimson roses. Neither has this heavily medicated boy whose imagination flies, an unencumbered bird, beyond betrayal and forgiveness, beyond his drugged fog. He's found a vein, an underground river he can ride to the lyrical heart of his own brutal poem. The difference is, his violence does not stay on the page. Our next reader is Jared Lysing. This is a poem called Translation, and it appeared in All Fire, All Water, as well as the Cascadia Poetry Anthology, um, Make It True. It begins with a question in parentheses, in Ars Poetica. In the hour of remembrance, a convention of crows gathers, rattles and caws in the crow tree, the newest capital city, and I caw back ululating at the boundaries of species, trying to tell them my nom de guerre from another kingdom, to ask them if a truer name might be hidden in their wordless flight. It is possible to love without translation. Can we climb these sounds to soul? Who can possibly understand another, no matter how close? My son signs eagle, and I think he means which, so close in fluttering hands. A struggle of limitations of the word to where a map might lie. Light moves through my body, but stops. I walk a frozen river, it becomes water, fluid and moving toward gill slits. Those slats that separate species rendering one consciousness from another, lungs I inherited and a given name, the voice I came with, imperfect bridge for crossing linguistic fences. Does my cat know the name of her kill? Does the lake know the name of her drowned? And the crows the names of their dead? Where is the Rosetta Stone to thread across? Thanks. There are a couple of other memorials, and I, I want to point out that um, there's one happening at the Hugo House on uh, Sunday the 23rd at 3 p.m. Sybil has more information on that. 
and Monday, March 30th at the Wedgwood Ale House as part of the Easy Speak series. And that'll be an open mic. So if you didn't get a chance to uh, speak today, I encourage you to attend that. Um, Jared, thanks for reading from this book. She made it a better book. She looked at it and made her comments and had an influence on that. And I'm grateful for that. Grateful for uh, Bumbershoot and the fact that she had the MC very early on in my poetry life. They had had faith in me, and um, and also for cre helping create Red Sky change my life. Mm -hmm. So she's had an influence, and this is a poem I wrote called No Map, No Judd, with an epigraph from Judith. Mm -hmm. How do we know where we are when the stars we navigate by no longer exist? For years it was the lit season's start, Bumbershoot's Alki room, and there'd be drumming or some cacophony right outside, <laughs> and Wanda Coleman would have to belt it out, put the drums in their place way below poetry. Yeah. <laughs> you orchestrated it all, between poems, raising kids, and east of the mountains assignations. Take your Detroit Midwest Labor Union positive sense and find the fish totems that swim backwards to sea. Navigate by stars, you'd say, to get back to the home stream. And again we find ourselves in November when the veil's thin, missing you. Reread your words that the mothers are dead and took all they knew back to the black plasma and imagination. And the dad's dead too, but still without clues, you'd write, knowing in all you did the future had to have a feminine slant to salve the masculinist hell that has broke loose and looks to take whales, fish, and the whole biosphere with it. History, you wrote, is the water we drink from the shallow footsteps of memory. So we praise history's unbroken line of poets, Say Shonagan, Emily Dickinson, Marianne Moore, Lorene Niedeker, Denise Levertov, Wanda, Diane De Prima, you, who show the way to human responsibility, the ability to respond, the grace, the water, clear and shining. We mine your work, dear poet. Feel your deep soul underneath. One star by which we once navigated as poets in this once emerald city, this Duwamish waterhead, has been plucked out. How the hell will we know where we are now as you turn back to dust upstream and begin this sacred star cycle once again? Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Our next reader is Barbara Earl Thomas. My opening is, which of these things is not like the other? I'm not a poet, <laughs> but I am so honored to be here. And if I could say, if the world could just be like we are in this room, that's all you have to do. I'm, um, I want to say just a few words before I read this poem, because people have talked about Judith. And Judith and I worked together a lot, but we worked for Bumbershoot. And we talked, you guys talked about her going to the, the literary festival. Well, where Judith and I would end up, we'd end up in the music, uh, the music um, events. And so once we ended up with the, the Isley Brothers. <laughs> and so there we were, in the middle, two ladies, not exactly young. In the middle, she looked at me, I looked at her, and she said, those arms. <laughs> those arms, and she said, will you hold me back? <laughs> and I said, why you hold me back? <laughs> and I looked at her and she looked at me, I looked at her badge, and I looked at, she looked at mine, and it said all access. <laughs> <laughs> After sleep, <laughs> the last time I came down the mountain trail, I searched for it your trace in violets and anemones, knowing you prefer the little flowers barely out of the leaf mold in damp ground, and your scent would linger for me under and over the sky smell of small blooms. When I found the flowers trampled, I knew it wasn't you who stepped through your pad, though your pads were broad. 
oh love, my season is coming full on me again. Which trail did you follow in the last migration? And where will you find your spring? Now we're going to have a brief intermission. Um, I want to alert you that there is, a, in the mixed media gallery, at the entrance there are vid uh, videos with some um, tapes that go with them. It is really lovely to step in there for a moment. I don't think it's going to be a very long intermission. Five minutes maybe? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and so come back um, and yeah, stretch your legs. <laughs> we have eight more readers. No. I know it's, it's wonderful to be together. It is, it is wonderful to be together. And it'll be wonderful to be together afterwards as well. So I would love to get going on this. So um, one thing I wanted to clarify, uh, Paul kindly mentioned that there's two other, other memorials planned for Judith. He mentioned one on the 23rd. I just want to be clear that that's February 23rd if you look out. Yes. So um, keep that in mind. Okay, we're gonna we're going to keep going with this wonderful event. Uh, our next reader is Elizabeth Austin. Is somebody needing to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that a little more about the Hugo House. Yes, would you like to come up, Sybil? Yes, if we can hear you. Can't believe you can't hear. You're biochem. A teacher for over 30 years. Um, yeah, there will be another memorial at Hugo House, February 23rd, from three to six, and there will be a, a short program, probably around four, with. Um, Judith's family with the slideshow and mm -hmm. some more stuff and Michael Horro is going to sing the International. Mikey. <laughs> 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 um, and then after that, anyone who wants to read a poem by or about Judith can just do it. I'm not organizing things, it's just free for all. Um, and we'll have some light refreshments and um, the Hugo House bar will be open until they run out of my money. <laughs> so, um, do, it'll be three to six, so you know, there'll be a little program, it'll be a little get together, new program, more little get togethers. And, and, and everyone is invited, so the public, if you know anybody else, that you think would be interested, please invite them to come. So I first met Judith um, when I was making the transition from being an actor to being a poet, and I think Judith was among the very first living poets that I met in Seattle. And she made a huge impression on me about what a poet ought to be in the world. And a couple of years after that, I started working at KUOW and working each summer with um, Judith to figure out what I would record for KUOW. And remember very well, Paul, the competing bands outside the window because it didn't go well for radio. Um, but Judith was a kind of example of someone who was willing to work incredibly hard to bring poetry to people who didn't know they needed what poetry offered. And so at Bumbershoot, people would wander in and then they would stay because of the people that Judith had brought in. I also just want to mention that in addition to that and Judith being such a poet of conscience, I'm really struck here today by how much she modeled how to be an elder. Um, and I think very much about that as an example for all of us as I, I look around the room and how we can all carry that forward in her honor. 
I also just wanted to mention that I was reading this morning an interview um, that she did. These glasses are not helping in this light. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try it this way. She mentioned, um, there was an interview she did with uh, Pamela Maynard, and this quote is so Judith. This is the voice I have been given to sing in, and I sing in the voice I was given. I am really drawn to this poem because it is so Judith's voice in the generosity and in the clarity and also in the mysticism. It's called In Midwinter and it's from Wisdom of the Body. It has a little epigraph after the party. What can we do but aim for beauty? Flowers in cut crystal, flame shimmering threads surrounding defiant cleavage, <laughs> insolence insouciance, even if it comes from the goodwill. <laughs> our goodwill tosses our heads like stamping horses, gathers friends for the great temporal gifts of food and wine. Our goodwill cleans the house, furniture, polishes the piano, and chops firewood in preparation. I understand medieval masked balls, glittering with percussive drums and torchlight, behind locked doors to keep the spores outside in the cold. In such hard times, and they always are. Our brave, brief flare registers the weight of the soul just before it leaves the body. <laughs> Our next reader is Anna Balin. Elizabeth about modeling elders. I have to just tell this little wee story. Hmm. I first met Judith, or rather, I shouldn't say first met her, but our friendship really began with evidence of, for, of compassion, which was a program that was done in the wake of 9-11 that I, with other people, organized, bringing voices of writers, poets from the region that was now being targeted with um, anti-Muslim sentiment, bringing those voices out to an audience. And so we have readers, students, and established literary people from you know all over Seattle. And Judith was one of the readers. And there was one of my students from El Centro who was a big believer in honoring your elders and helping your elders. So he stationed himself by the stage. This was at Elliott Bay, and it was about this high, with a little thing to step up. And so Judith comes along, and he thinks, oh, an elder. <laughs> and Judith was like, out of my way, young man. <laughs> so, but I just have to say, I have a lot of wonderful memories. This Many of us do, but my absolute favorite has to be, there's a short time in 2000, end of 2017, 18, when we were getting together, not every week, but like every other week, for, just for a short time, exchanging poems. And Judith sh was sh sharing stuff that had to do with Detroit, pieces that weren't finished, and we won't get into what I was sharing. but. The memories of that time, sitting at that wooden table with mugs of hot ginger tea, talking poetry, <coughs> and motherhood, which was a big thing. You know, I too raised special needs children. And, and just looking out into that gorgeous green garden, and I will never forget that. Just quiet time. Okay, but the poem I'm going to read has to do with poop. Uh, <laughs> and uh, 
How many of you used the bathroom a moment ago? We don't think about what happens when we flush. So, and Judith's a poet that writes about everything, particularly when it comes to things that have to do with the environment and our planet and the health of our planet, which this book, Or Fire or Water, has got a, a lot of stuff in. And I use this poem as a prompt at um, Safe Place Writing Circle at Recovery Cafe, where, where I teach every Friday, sort of like small blessings, things we take for granted, you know. So, blessings for the biosolids. <laughs> for the journey of nutrients from food to feces, to compost and back again, to eggplant, parmesan, or tabbouleh. <laughs> blessings for helpful microbes mixing juices and decay, their messy business of heating, eating, discarding, transforming one thing to another, the fetid to the fragrant, from waste to muck to rich soil for the fields. Blessings for the biosolids whose elements began in burning spheres of ancient star systems born of crucibles of burning light. Praise for minerals, new mind from stars, connecting any one of us to Nefertiti, Joan of Arc, Attila the Hun, Chief South, Salmon, Centipedes, <laughs> Carbon-based creatures all, certainly the stuff of stars. Blessing for the mighty microbes within the core of us. Blessing for the black gold of rich compost, new cleansed by heat and broken down by fungi and bacteria, dry, transformed, now sweet and loamy trucked to wheat fields of the Palouse to fertilize our daily bread. Blessings for the earthy cycle, from food to waste to humus, and back again to food. Blessings. Yeah. Our next reader is Noelle Franklin. Hello. Hello. Oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. Uh -huh. You know, it was the mid 90s, and I was a furious and wounded slam poet, uh, just full of darkness and desire to overcome darkness. And, uh, I did this thing called founding the Seattle Poetry Festival. I don't know what the hell I was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> uh, so Stephen Thomas uh, recommended I go intern at the Bumbershoot Literary Stage. Um, I must say, Judith, uh, she could see things in people. You know, I was on stage in Seattle screaming about this terrible childhood, you know, in my slam poetry. <laughs> And nobody seemed to catch on that I actually meant it, that I was, I was ripping my guts out and trying to heal through art. And Judith just saw that and, and got right to work on developing my potential. Like, she did not pause. Mm -hmm. We worked together, the literary stage, and, um, and she, oh, we were both welders. I was a welder at a shipyard in Bellingham, so I got my art degree. Nobody, quote, flash dance. Um, anyways, uh, so I, I was in the first inaugural Jack Straw Writers Program as well, just about the same time. What a time. It was insane. It was crazy. And Judith has always been part of my development, and even later when I fell. So when she passed, I, I cried and cried. I was in Arizona. I was fighting my uh, an addiction, which I feel like I'm on the other side of. And this poem, this poem, this song, a song came to me. So I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to sing to you, so bear with me. A little song for Judith. Over two decades ago, I said I wanted to be poetry. And someone said they knew a woman who had done just that very thing. <laughs> and they led me to a festival where you created epicness on stage. 
You shared with me your knowledge, monumental generosity. Took one look at my stance and said, you thought that I could do good things. And when we became friends, we could recite each other's poetry off page. Well, I'll always be a screamer. And when the darkness overtook me, you threw lifelines from afar. And you said that you loved me unconditionally. You'd seen people come back from worse things. When the spin came, you said, keep on spinning. Well, I hope you know you helped me. And I wish I wrote that letter. And I hope that you got better, but you faded from our view. And now, I'm left here to be grateful that I even got to know you as I did. Thank you, dear. And rest in peace, dear. Thank you. Our next reader is Jerry Gold. For those of you who don't know me, I, I was Judas' publisher. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a poem which is not like most of the poetry she published. It's a narrative poem. It's uh, from All Fire, All Water. It's called Hoffa. And I like this poem particularly. Well, for one thing, I like stories. It's a narrative poem. Um, but also, Judith, as I knew her, wanted always to live in beauty. And there's some ugliness in this poem, some humiliation. But in this poem, even with the humiliation, well, because of the humiliation, she manages to turn even that into something beautiful. So this is Hoffa. Uh, anybody not know who Hoffa was? <laughs> That day, a substitute appeared in history, a stranger, reading the role and stumbling over unfamiliar surnames, full of aspirants and strange combinations of diphthongs. It was mid-century Detroit, and we were a mixed bunch. I remember her coming to a boy's name, the unhealthy gleam of almost prurient curiosity. Hoffa, she pounced. Are you the son? Aloud and loud, every child and teacher in Cooley High School knew this boy was the son of the famous name, with shrill and bold types on our nightly newspapers. Miss K, of the Polish name with many consonants, our real teacher, would not have made the boy talk about it. We were in the 11th grade. What did we know of adults' intrusive probing into an open wound? We were only beginning to learn of adult agendas. We were not quite blanks, but still growing the faces we would become. Yeah. The boy just said yes. The kids leaned in, held their collective breath, embarrassed for the boy. <coughs> well, what does your father think about the newspapers, she pressed, and ishing in her voice. And is he guilty? <coughs> We're in the 11th grade for such a short time. We're just learning the meaning of the word grace. We were beginning to grow language and abstraction, like chin hairs and new breasts. Though most of us could not yet have used grace in connection with a kid in our class. But the boy found it in his answer. He said it was not part of history yet, and so beyond the realm of the class. I told the story at home. My father just rattled his paper. I don't believe what they say, my mother finally said. They've been through his life with a fine tooth comb and can find no murder to pin on him, nothing to prove. When that father did go to prison, it was not for murder, but tax evasion. My mother would say they could prove nothing worse. And, my mother continued, he's never been unfaithful to Josephine, the wife. My mother would care about that. That ought to count for something. It was Detroit. Snow fell, ice ring bare tree branches in winter, 
Political dynasties fell and rose. Labor unions gained strength and lost it. Winter and summer in the Midwestern contrast continued. History is the water we drink from, the shallow footsteps of memory. Years later in Alaska, where we got few newspapers, we got the one that said that father had disappeared, presumed murdered. I closed my eyes for grief, my high school friend, his sister, and Josephine. The story goes on, as they all do, for those left. For years, the father's disappearance became a national joke on talk shows and comics routines, and, and still is. Cement shoe jokes, common in Detroit, New York, Chicago. Funny to some. I've seen the son on national television here and there over the years. James, the son, graying, as I am, looking more and more like Jimmy, the father, now matured into the dignity he found first in the 11th grade. Thank you. Call. All gratitude to Jack Straw for hosting this and for all of you for being part of it. I met Judith when we were both um, working in the Writers in the Schools program and then we taught together at Hugo House and also at Pacific Lutheran University and I was also in the 2008 cohort of the Writers Program that she curated here. And I'm always going to remember the profound experience of being interviewed by Judith as part of that program. She had such a deep gift for bringing out the deep stories of a person. And I am not nearly as good an interviewer as Judith was, uh, but I did interview her um, on August 9th, 2016. And I'm going to read some brief excerpts from that interview, which I have rearranged, uh, but these are all Judith's words. When I was younger, 30 or 40 years younger, I was very attached to the land. There were some poems I'm very proud of in Ghost, my first book, that are very land-based. But mostly I was attached to husbands or boyfriends of the time, and I was raising children. My mother loved the idea of art, but she thought it was important to do things in the world that would make a difference. I got my love of art from her, from her stories about ancient Greece, the Arthurian legend, Victorian poetry. She read a lot, and she appreciated art. I write a lot of Michigan poems now. I call these deep memory poems because it's so long ago. Michigan is a long way away from me, but it is so deep in me. It is my land. Michigan is deep in me, like childhood is deep in all of us. Another thing that I've learned in my advanced age. I recently wrote a poem about going coon hunting with my dad, and the dogs, the black and the tan, and the blue tick hound. This is memory through the child's eyes. Because it is such deep memory, you don't know whether or not it's true. My parents kept us close to the land. I've always said that the land is what broke me open. I had always written some, but writing just broke me open in a different way after I came back from Alaska, after working on the pipeline. I had an Alaskan boyfriend who said, hey, come up and make tons of money. I was in my early 30s, so I let, had to leave my children with their father to do it. I'd go for three months and work, then I would go back home and do kids intensively, and then back again. I only did three stints, but it was enough money to put a down payment on my house. I don't know if I ever could have had a house otherwise. By law, there needed to be 10% women on the pipeline. Of course, there were very few women who knew how to do anything, including me. But I was never asked to do anything difficult, just drilling and riveting. That's easy. You worked 714s when you were on the line. When you were done, you would go back to town. I had the Alaska boyfriend, so I was out on the bush a fair amount and on many day float trips on the Yukon. I was writing poems and lots of notes, notes, notes that I thought maybe I'd turn into a book. I never wrote the Alaska book. I came back focused more on the writing and thinking I could do this. 
You know, the feeling in Alaska is you can do anything you want. The land influenced me so much that when I got home and was writing more poems, poems about the Yukon just kept coming out. We need to ground poetry in place, but you also need to put in the human. Poems that are just descriptions of beautiful landscape are so boring. <laughs> a lot of people think there is a dichotomy, that if you're a city girl, you don't get nature in the same way that country people do, in spite of the fact that I am so deeply attached to the water and the land and the hills and the salmon and the animals. I really am a city girl. They fit together in me and for me. I love the idea of public art. We learn from art that has grace in it. We want art to inform us, make people think, be provocative. This marries my mother's vision and mine. What we know about ancient civilizations is through their art. And there may be a time when nothing is left of our civilization, but the art will stand. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. You're very welcome. So the next reader who was supposed to be here with us today is Jana Kaz Ezri, who was also in the 2008 Jack Straw Writers Cohort. And she is home with a very bad flu, and she's very sorry not to be here. So I'm going to read uh, the introduction to the poem that she chose for uh, Judith, and then Elizabeth Austin will read the poem. So these are Jana Kaz Ezri's words. I'm honored to celebrate Judith's life with her family and friends, students, fellow writers, Jack Straw community, and the countless others that she touched through her words and her deeds. I remember Judith's piercing gaze, expansive warmth, and the way she listened between the words. I admired her strength and her sense of humor. Judith and I shared a love of the sea, so I wanted to commemorate the public poetry and advocacy work she did to raise awareness about the endangerment of the Pacific Northwest wild salmon. In 2001, her series of poems called Salmon Sweet was installed at the Hiram Chittenden Locks in Ballard. These poems describe in lush imagery and cadence the life cycle of the salmon. I encourage you to listen to the recordings of Judith reading these poems in her own voice, either online or at the fish ladder. The poem I chose to read today is called Smolt. It's a poem about beginning, even when you are not sure where you're going. Smolt, mid-April to late July. Smolt travel backwards until they reach salt water. Being young, I don't know where I go. I face my lake and float backward into my future, trembling on the edge of what I can't yet see, green shadowed. I go with water's flow and trust strange rapture singing in my blood. Ride the river like a knife's edge. Breathe and float. Oxygen and insect cut and rise. I've seen where I've been, so rehearse my return, tracing it in latticed strands recorded in starry lace fabric of night. Current pulls me down to spill over smolt slide, plunge the plashy fall, slip the snap of gray bird's beak. Turn to face ocean, opening flat and wide, beyond imagining no horizon. Taste first fingers of bitter brine. Flick silver and learn salt. Because my throat itches, I swallow what awaits me. Begin young. I've cut my heart on the dream of the high seas. Our next reader is Kevin Kraft. Hello. Um, 
not long after I met Judith, I bought my own purple house. <laughs> she told me I had done the right thing. <laughs> uh, I am uh, one of those who met, uh, Judith brought into this community I met, uh, in 2008 along with Wendy and John and a few others you'll hear from. Uh, uh, I feel honored and blessed to have been brought into this community by Judith. I think I've always thought of myself ever since as one of Judith's brood. Um, and she, indeed, she's one of the, as Paul alluded to earlier, one of the matriarchs of Northwest Letters in the same vein as one of our poetry mothers, uh, in the same vein as Joan Swift and Carolyn Kaiser. And she's the one I knew best. This poem is called Yesterday, Today, and uh, I read it to show a little bit of her uh, formal uh, diversity or um, variety. She throws herself at the Villanelle here. And I also just love that title, Yesterday, Today, the way it applies the seam of time. <coughs> Yesterday, the broken heart of the world opened and allowed the great rains down. Sorrow holding tight, unfurled. Last leaves lost their grip and swirled to litter sodden on the ground. Yesterday, the broken heart of the world was overwhelmed, too sore to hold. But today's sky found light again. Something held tight, unfurled, forgot, abused children, cruelty, and war. If only for a minute. The sound of the broken heart of the world. Madly glorious, November warmth curled down on amber autumn, surprising all around. Sorrow holding tight, unfurled. Today some pain tore open and golden sun crowned. Yesterday, the broken heart of the world, sorrow, held tight, unfurled. <laughs> Michael Daly couldn't be here. He lives up in Port Townsend and has had, there's been weather and other things happening. So Phoebe Boucher is going to come up and read um, for Michael. I knew Judith Multi through Red Sky Poetry Theater and Uppershoot and our parties that went late into the night at Red Sky. I remember she was the most beautiful, sexy dancer that I've ever seen, something I could never be. <laughs> Serious childhood. I mean, this is Michael poem that he wanted to read. He published her first book, um, Ghosts. My first memories are of walking a picket line. Somewhere I sit on steps of a downtown building. I am very small. We are singing solidarity forever. My mother keeps me away from angels and Madonna pictures and fears the nun's fervor in my eyes. She is not Catholic. Her high dare was to cross a picket line, drop secretly a stink bomb, perfect and round, crushing in its paper bag. The department store crowd scattered and screamed, and she loved her braveness. I still loved angels but thought she was one. She talked about freedom and dignity. I saw a solitary riverside where I turned myself into a mermaid. My mother sang, just like a tree a standing by the water, we shall not be moved. We were serious in those days. She took me to see the Diego Rivera mural, mural at the art museum car factory workers full of sweat and muscle strain. She said rich people didn't believe working people worked that hard. I looked at the angel pictures. We both meant it. And I want to read the second stanza of another poem in this book called Spirit to the Winds. 
I stayed up at night fueled by late coffee, red wine, and the velocity of headlong, long dark, planning my own funeral. I want Edith Piaf to sing Non Je Regret Rien loud and over and over. Everyone drunk and danced to the state of trance, an imported whirling dervish spitting off to ecstasy, strove blazes of white light, thick dark. Men, especially those I've loved, and women in magenta silk, mauve, tight jeans, and lips. <coughs> it has to be summer and moist night air. Hairline cracks of lightning splitting the sky, the sound of thunderous horse hooves, the scent of lavender, pee up over and over with a faint electrical trace of ozone. It shouldn't end until the record or the diamond needle wears out. <laughs> I dreamed of drowning. Woke in the night to sob into your so shoulder, your man smell comforting me. In the morning you said, when you turned to cradle my sleeping body, I moaned as if I were coming. It became my prayer. Yeah. Our next reader is Sharon Cumberland. Thank you. Um, I first met Judith. I too am a member of the 2008 uh, Jack Straw group. I had the privilege of being here that year. It was one of many, many gifts that Judith gave to me. I came here in 1994 to uh, work at Seattle University, and Judith and Sybil James were two of the first poets I met here because they had helped to design the program that I was coming to participate in. And uh, Judith and, uh, led me into her community. She did all these wonderful things for me. She invited me to read a bumper shoot. And uh, I, was, I was sort of a warm-up poet for Robert Haas. I mean, it was the first time I got some sense of you know, poetry being big. And uh, she uh, then uh, she joined a group of poets called the Greenwood Poets. The Greenwood Poets have been at the Greenwood Senior Center, critiquing each other's work every week since uh, 2003. Mm -hmm. And Judith joined in 2006 and uh, stayed with us until 2015. And uh, just uh, in the wake of all these events surrounding uh, her passing, I went through my old notebooks, because I write down the name of everybody who was present and the title of the poem that they did. And the list of poems that she worked through with the Greenwood Poets is three pages long, many of the poems that we have heard here today. And uh, uh, a lot of poems that maybe never saw the light of day. But one of the great things about Judith was that she's a wonderful critic. Uh, it was a great pr privilege to have a poet as, as accomplished as Judith um, helping us uh, improve our own work. It was so typical of Judith to be generous like that. I'm going to read a poem of my own that I wrote. Uh, my husband and I were fortunate to uh, see her right before her passing, but when she died I was so sad and I just wrote a poem. It's called City of Change for Judith Roche. Now in the fog of sunsets a mist is falling over the city. The gray erasure of familiar structures, the ones I've loved the longest. I'm losing track of my landmarks, my map of all that matters. And you, your wall of books, your scarf on the piano, your stove of black-eyed peas to celebrate the turning years, your skyscraper of poems, the architecture of art, your literary universe of light, Will you leave us now on the dark sidewalk? What corner am I on? Which way should I walk? I spot a wolf in the gloom. Its bright fur glows. It looks over its shoulder. I'll go first, it says. You follow. It trots into the mist. The 
Greenwood poets typically gave me a hard time because my wolf had red fur, and they, they, they're looking up on their phones, and they say, there aren't any red wolves in this area. They only are in South Carolina. You have to change <laughs> So now I'm going to read uh, Judith's great poem called Credo. I believe in the cave paintings that let's go, the beauty of the clavicle, the journey of the salmon. I believe in all the gods. I don't, I just don't like some of them. <laughs> I believe the war is always against the imagination, is recurring, repetitive, and relentless. I believe in fairies, elves, angels, and bodhisattvas. Santa Claus, and the Tooth Fairy. I believe Raven invented the earth, and so did Coyote. In archaeology lies the clue. The threshold is numinous, and the way it is, is the way out. I believe in the alphabets, all of them, and the stories seeping from between their letters. I believe in dances, prayer, that the heart bear, that the heartbeat invented rhythm and chant. Or is it the other way around? I believe in the wisdom of the body. I believe that art saves lives, and love makes it worth living them. <coughs> and that could be the other way around, too. <laughs> Our last reader is Judith Skillman. Is Judith here? Yes. yes. Okay. She's coming. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. It's really an honor to be here, and I'm overwhelmed as well. Um, it's a lovely event to honor Judith. I was in Jack Straw 2008 um, as a poet, and so I'm one of her brood. So I remember Judith Roche, her fighting spirit and red hair, her fiery wit. I remember how she served both individuals and the community at large. I remember all the ways in which she was selfless and affirming. and. Um, and I have to say, I'm struck hearing all of you, and thank you for your poems that you've read and all your words. But especially hearing Judith's poems, the musicality of her language just comes through over and over. I also remember the library in her Leshai home contained signed books by many, many poets. It was unparalleled, as far as I could see, by any bookstore shelf. Um, and she had, we, 2000, eight readers over for potluck dinner and that's when I saw her purple house <laughs> and I learned that she was a master gardener and she had peonies and lilacs and eglantine roses and vegetables and raised beds and she treated us all like royalty. Um, so I remember what she said about the name Judith when I complained about it to her. <laughs> I personally have had a very difficult time with the name, and I told her so. You have to grow into it. And regarding my husband Tom, when I complained to her about him, as I am wont to do, she said, I don't have it, Tom. <laughs> Judith was the epitome of grace and heart. So I'm going to read her poem, Heart, from All Fire, All Water. Heart. It's a hollow vessel that must host a river at flow or die. The four rooms of come and go Doors opening and closing, high and low. Our core, cœur, circulating, calls out for ease on an odd bridge. Soul spiders 
flings strings to a land we might fail to find, muscular dance in concentric circles of heavy loss. It's an attack that might come, a burn, a scalding sensibility which might break us finally or bring fragrant scent of woods violet and wild ginger, depending on how the wind might blow and the smell of the soul. The heart, lion or lily, wants what it wants and will not be denied. The song could be a Puccini aria or Robert Johnson blues, the background of the bargain. So, I forgot something important. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, some of you have been mentioned in Judith's enormous collection of books. And she always talked about what a fabulous collection she had, mm -hmm. of, especially of the Northwest. And there will be three places where those collections will be housed now. Here at Jack Straw, a collection of Northwest Writers chapbooks. At um, Hugo House, a collection of small press Northwest Writers, not chapbooks, mm -hmm. and a kind of a mishmash that will be in our friend Arthur Lynch's bookmobile which he drives around on Bainbridge Island. So please avail yourself of the wonderful, it's really a chronicle history of the, the literature of Seattle. Mm -hmm. I want to say uh, thank you to all our readers today, uh, especially to Sahara for her uh, eulogy is so moving. Um, thank you to all of you for coming. Um, we have refreshments outside. Uh, it's been such an honor. I think Judith would approve of her party. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I think we can cut ourselves in the back.